those that um, don't know me, my name is Alicia Menendez. I didn't ask to do the formal introduction here. Um, so on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies, we are really, really pleased to have Juan Pablo Michelini, who is going to lead this series of workshops on growth and poverty in Latin America. Oh, yeah. um, Juan Pablo is the Center for Professor this year, visiting us. Is hosted by the Department of Economics. And Juan Pablo, for those that didn't met him uh, last year, is one of our own. He received his degree from the Department of Economics here at the University. And he's now the president of the Universidad Torcuato di Tela in Buenos Aires, Argentina, one of the most prestigious universities in Latin America. I don't go through the whole CV because it's extensive and we don't want to waste time. We want to go to the reflections here, but I want to tell Juan Pablo how pleased we are he's here and how delighted we are he's presented this uh, workshop. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here again. Uh, as Alicia said, I've been in Hyde Park for many years and coming back it's always a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure. Uh, what, uh, so what I want to do is to to talk about something that I care a lot, and I guess you too, and that I don't really know the, the answers. Uh, so uh, the idea this year was to try to, to, to bring some issues that, that would be uh, suitable for a, for, for a debate. Uh, so what I have done is to prepare, I have actually 20 slides, so my rule is that if you have a 30 minute presentation, you cannot put more than 20 slides. So it's two slides every three minutes, that will do a reasonable presentation. If, if you don't speak, I will be done by in 30 minutes. And that's, that's not the idea. What I, I'll try to do is to, to, to put some things which I think are very important. Uh, and as I said, I'll, I'll just put on the, on, the, on the table the things that I think we know and open the Questions that uh, that we still that we still don't know. This is like a like a like a kind of a key issue. It's hard to to think about other things, uh, particularly if you live or you care uh, for for the Latin American region. I, I, I satisfy both requirements, so uh, it's 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 something I think a lot about and many people think a lot about and, and we wish we had better answers than what we have. <coughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the key of what I'll be discussing and I would say most of the, I mean, the, the, the three uh, times we'll, we'll, we'll meet uh, is going to be this lack of growth. And I'll try to put perspective into, into what I mean by lack of growth and what's the impact that this lack of growth has on the quality of life of millions of people. Uh, I won't be showing you like data on poverty. Uh, I, my, I, my, I, I can mention what I know about it. Uh, what I want to try to uh, push the discussion towards is the, the which are like the big issues that one should be discussing if we un, would like to see 30 years from now uh, Latin American region with a tenth of the poverty rate that what we have today. But that's like a like a like a great goal. Uh, it's feasible, but it's far from obvious that we'll actually make it. Okay, so by the time I retire at 70 something, the question is which is how many poor people do we have in Latin America? And, and, and there is a wide variety of possibilities as of today. Uh, and that's where I want to 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 push the 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 discussion. Um, what I had a piece of paper at, at some point, but I misplaced it. So I'm going to ask someone to this. This would this would qualify. This is a calculus one three two homework four. But on this other side, <laughs> if you plan to come back again, and if you want to get on advance the slides that we'll be using in the next series, you write your email here and. And I'll take them with me, and then I'll just two days before the next lecture, I'll, I'll mail the, the slides of what we'll be discussing uh, for the for the next meeting. 
So that's like in terms of logistics. I should have said that in the beginning. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's what I'll try to do, and I'll be today. I basically will be giving you data that comes out of the paper that was uh, in the in the in the in the list, which is uh, Latin American the rear view mirror or something like that, by Hal Cole, Yohanian, and some other people. Uh, I will not go too much into the answers they provide, even though we can in the discussion, if you want, but not, not in my presentation. Um, so let me just make one big issue at the beginning. So this all this discussion about the difference between, particularly this is a, 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 a discussion we economists do a lot, which is the difference between growth theory and development theory. We, when we cannot measure stuff, we feel kind of in bad shape when we do economics. So uh, that's why we like a lot of growth theory, because there we talk about something we can measure, which is GDP per capita. And the numbers I'll be showing you most of the times today, and the ones I will refer to, are these figures on GDP per capita. Uh, now, deep down, uh, honestly, I don't really it doesn't bother me too much that middle-income people in Argentina cannot buy a second home. I, would be nice? Yeah, I guess it would be nice. Uh, but that's not something that would take my energy in, in thinking many, many hours. Now, what we think about when we, when, when we, we think in terms of, 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 of development is that that picture of those five kids in a favela in Rio, four of them naked, uh, walking barefoot in the mud, while it rains and they're eating bread, which has some little bit of mud on it. Okay, so that, that when, when, when I think in terms of poverty, that, that's the kind of problem the millions of people are facing, and that's what I, what I care about. So why should then look at a measure like GDP per capita, where also is the fact that middle-income people can or not buy a second home? And that's the first thing I want to address. I'll try to convince you that then it's worth looking at GDP per capita figures, at least at the way in which the paper that I, that I mentioned looks at the figures, which is exactly the same way I will be looking at those figures. So the, but deep in my mind, I'll be thinking about poverty rates, health care, education, and particularly for the, even I, I, if, you, if you want that we focus only on the fourth poorest uh, people in a, in a given country, that's fine with me. I still want to argue that if you look at the figures that I'm, I'll put on the, on, the, on the screen today, you get a pretty good picture of like, the big issues at, at stake. Okay, so that's, that's the, the first thing I want to do. So my, my first issue is that, is it true that countries with higher production per capita, higher GDP per capita, have less poverty, better health care, and better education than poorer countries on average? And the answer is yes. So before going to, this, to the second question, let me just give you this. So this is a graph. Here you have countries. This is an incentive for you to sit close to the screen. <laughs> Actually, I try to make it bigger, but my technology with PDF ain't good enough. So basically, what is, this is a picture of, this is figure one of the paper on, uh, on the rear view uh, mirror. And basically, what this has is the GDP per capita of the United States, which is the richest country in the world, equal to 100 for, uh, actually, this is, I think, 203. But any, a few years from, I mean, basically now, okay? And then what you have here is countries on the, on the horizontal line, and they are ordered by how rich they are relative to the U.S. Okay, so if the U.S. is 100, it's the richest one, so all the others are going to be below 100. So how high is the, this, this thing then tells you how rich is the country. So like Norway is number two, and it's like 87. So that means it's 87 percent as rich as, as the United States. So what's the point of this graph? Well, here you have all the countries they look at uh, from Europe, uh, Latin America, and then a few other places which are in neither in those continents like Australia and New Zealand. And they also have Canada. Why they pick this set of countries is uh, it's, a, it's a tricky business, particularly when we go to the Asian countries, I'll show you afterwards. But this is basically you have everything in Europe, and then you have 
Latin America, the, the, the large Latin American countries, and then you also have Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. So it happens to be that the whole set of Latin American countries are all poorer than the whole, the whole set of countries, which is not going to surprise you. Um, but the point I want to make now is not that this is a much poorer region than this, because that you already knew. The point that I'm trying to make is that if you were thinking in terms of having, uh, if you were, okay, if you had to choose a country where to educate your children or give health care to your children, which is the country you would like to be if you are the guy that makes the average income? Okay, so that, that's the question I want to, I want to raise. So then, which you can, and now I'm telling you, okay, you can pick two different like, leagues, the black league or the, or the gray league. So in the gray league, you're going to get randomly one country out of this group, and in the black league, you're going to get randomly one country out of this group. Well, I could just ask you to give me the colors, but I mean, it's clear that in this set of countries, you're going to get less poverty, lower poverty rates, better health care, better education, even for, for the poorest 10% of the population. Okay, so that's, that's the, my, my first point. On average, this, the, I mean, that's why we call them developed countries, and they're richer also. Okay, so my point is that this GDP per capita figure, it is a very good indicator. If you're, you're going to look like at that set of countries, it's a very good indicator of development. So if we think in terms of that picture, how many of those kids you have uh, in these countries and how many you have in these countries, well, you're going to have a much more proportion of the population in these countries as in the, than in this one. So that's my first, my first point here when I say if this is true on average. Then we can discuss among each group which country do we want. So is it true that this holds for any pair of countries? Like you get a, two countries, one richer than the other, and then you're going to get less poverty, less better health care, and better uh, education for the poor? Well, not necessarily. I'll just give you one particular example. Let's go to this, to this country. Argentina is here, Spain is here, and the US is here. If I were the middle, if the guy living in a country with the average income, and if it were just because of healthcare, my choice of countries would be first Spain, and I wouldn't be sure about Argentina or the US, because I haven't been the average for a while, so I cannot really talk about my my experience. Okay, so in terms of health, I would go to Spain and not to the US. If that were my only concern, right? If I like, we're going to have like five kids and I knew that we're going to have some health troubles and which is the country I would choose to live, conditional on being the average, the, the, the guy that makes the average income, then I wouldn't choose the US, I would choose Spain. I lived in both countries, three years in one, four in, in the other. Okay, that you may not have to agree with me, but my point is that I don't want to try to convince you that GDP tells you that everything is better. What, I'm, what I want to think is that geez, if we want to think about poverty in Latin America, the first thing we have to think about is that in 30 years from now, when we look at these numbers, this is not on the 2030, this is on the 60, 70. Okay, this is like the big picture about the whole thing. And, and then at the end, I will argue that when one looks at the problem like this, says, well, gee, that's absolutely impossible. It's not. And then what we have learned from growth theory and the experience of the last couple of decades still teaches us that that's not the case. So uh, let me go back to, so if you wanted to argue that we don't have to look at GDP per capita, this is the time. Because given that you're silent, I'm going to assume that I convince you that looking at GDP per capita, it is a pretty good indicator of what, uh, when you're talking about regions, not of a particular country, because then you may have countries with different policies, right? But when you're talking about whole regions, uh, and we want to think in terms of, of poverty and the quality of health care and education and housing that the, tenth, the lowest 10% of the income distribution uh, has access to, uh, then it's a pretty good measure. Okay, so I'm going to move slowly to change the slide, this is the time to complain if you don't like me to look at this, at this measure. Okay, so now when, once you go into a region, then of course you can have very different policies. 
And if you're going to be a poor in, a, in an economy, you don't, you, know, you don't care only about the average income. You care about many other things. Right? And then I, involve, I put here, I put, I put many of them. There may be countries that have more poverty alleviation policies, uh, where there, is a, there are health systems or education systems with varying degrees of redistribution. Right? There, uh, if you look in terms of the, maybe the healthcare in Spain has a huge amount of redistribution. You basically pay a fixed fraction of your income, and then you have access to exactly the same health services than anybody else. That's a huge amount of redistribution. There is much less amount of redistribution in, in Argentina, for instance, in terms of, of health care. Uh, so you might have all these differences. And of course, these things are going to affect poverty rates. So once you get into the region, then there may be countries with different policies. And we, and we can discuss about that. So to me, the discussion whether you're left, whether you're right, whether you're conservative or not, is a discussion about this. But having a low GDP is not fun for even, even if you're left, leftist or right winger, or, it's just not fun. It's much better if you have a high GDP per capita than if you have a low GDP per capita, particularly when you think in terms of, and that's like the big problem of Latin America today. It's not about better or worse policies in terms of redistributing income. That might change tiny bits of the problem. But the big picture is, is basically this low GDP per capita. Now, this, the issue of ideology is, of, is it's of course, going to plague the discussion about poverty rates and stuff like that, right? How, how, much, how much a political system reduced, redistributes towards the poor, it's, of course, something that we can talk about and we can debate a lot. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I mean, that discussion should be made once one agrees that Policy should be like the right policy, right? So the discussion is about policy objectives, and then uh, you have to pick the right policies to achieve those objectives. It turns out that sometimes uh, um, you can f discuss whether some policies are actually worse than no policy at all. And that's a discussion we can have. I'm not going to be pushing that discussion necessarily today, but you are free to interrupt and 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 raise this issue. So I, I just wrote this question, and it's in bold, uh, not because I'm going to talk about it, it's because I want to put it in here. And then we, of course, eventually, we might want to talk about these things. But I'm not going to be talking about policy uh, today. There is a discussion about policy in this paper, not one that I particularly like, uh, and I'm not going to talk about it, unless you, of course, raise the, raise, raise the issue. Uh, but this is, of course, a key, a, key, a key thing. But let me go to numbers. <clears throat> so this is uh, figure two of the, of the paper. Uh, this is a, a, a very ad hoc version of 20th century, starts in 1950. The reason why I, they don't have the numbers from 1900 is because they don't have them. Um, I will give you some numbers from Latin America, which are very similar to the ones they have in the paper, even though uh, I'll show them differently to you, and they will start in the 30s. But what is this, this, uh, this graph? So this is time, goes from this is the second half of the 20th century. And we have basically three different regions, Europe, Latin America, and Asia. Um, this is not all Asia. I think the, the, the trickiest part of the paper is how they pick the countries that they're going to call Asia. They're, they're calling Asia the countries that grow, that grew during this period. They're not taking all of the countries of, uh, from, from Asia. And that's, that kind of distorts the picture. But still, the numbers are so huge that, uh, that, uh, that it's tempting to think, why? I mean, how can we do to get to be red instead of being blue? So what's the difference between red and blue? Blue is Latin America, the red is Asia. What is this thing measuring? Again, what this is measuring is the GDP per capita of the region relative to the GDP per capita of the US for that particular year. OK, so if we look at the black line, well, that's Europe. So this is telling us that in 1950, 
If you take all these European countries and you compute the GDP per capita for all these uh, European countries, the number you would get would be 40% of the number for the US. Now, what this shows you then over time is how Europe grew relative to the US. The fact that the black line is going up means that Europe had been growing in terms of GDP per capita at a higher rate than the US. Okay, so it was 40% of the GDP per capita of the US in, in 1950, and then it went up to 75% by the early 80s. And then it remained constant since the, early 80s, since the middle of the 80s till the end. So basically, this, the fact that this black line is flat is telling, uh, well, actually it went down a little bit, but, but not by much. Uh, it's basically telling us that the Europe had been growing at the rate of the US. Now, the f so w we call this thing convergence. When this thing goes up, we say, okay, these countries are poorer than the US, but they're closing the gap, right? The, the fact that the line is going up means they're growing faster than the US, which means they're closing the gap. So basically, what this picture is telling us that Europe close the gap, this group, the selected group of Asians, close the gap by a lot, and the Latin American countries actually widen the gap. So we started being actually pretty much between Europe and Asia in terms of GDP per capita. This is all relative to the US. Uh, but now we are far behind. Yes? Um, sorry, I was late. Um, you're talking about the coal paper. Yes. Coal yes. Um, well, they don't take into consideration. I mean, it's a, it's a very ahistorical paper, from my point of view. And, and although they talk about culture a little bit, but it's, it's an afterthought. They don't take into consideration that Europe um, had the Marshall Plan. And, um, and, but, and, and that's in America, on the other hand, before 1960s or 1970s even, they didn't have the massive amount of international aid that Europe had in the post-war period? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there, so let me just uh, insist on two things. I'm going to take some of the numbers they have. Uh, the, the numbers, are, it's, it's pretty clear how they build and how, how they make the numbers. Um, and the different thing is how some of their interpretations, OK? So let me go to the numbers, which is what this, what this table is about. It's definitely true. There are I mean, many things happen in one place that didn't happen in other. Not all the European countries had the, had the, had the same amount of aid, particularly like Spain didn't have particularly much. Spain had to be the, the wrong guys had won the war, civil war uh, in terms of the international dimension, so they actually didn't have much, much aid. Actually, I remember that during the, sometime during the 50s, it was actually Argentina the one that was giving aid to Spain. Uh, so we'll, we, we can come back to the issue of aid, and actually I'm going to talk a lot about the issue of aid next lecture when we, we'll, when we go through some of the Bill Easterly's, Bill Easterly's chapters. Now, um, you're going to see many of these Asian countries that without aid, they also made it. Um, but I, this is pushing a little bit the discussion onto which are the factors that explain the differences. And I would like to spend still a few minutes in, 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 in going into detail where, where, where the differences are. And then we'll come back to the issue of whether aid has been a, 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 key, a key issue or not. Um, but I mean, the differences are like brutal. What's the difference between 0.6 and 0.2 and say, well, not much. Well, once you put the numbers the right way, they're, they're, they're really huge. And, I, and I'll go to, back to that by the end of the, of the, of the slides, on the last slide. Uh, so let me just hold a little bit the issue of aid, uh, basically until the next until the next meeting. Although I mean we can come back at particular points to issue like I'm going to put countries now, uh, and then we can eventually discuss again what what the role play there. Um, but I mean I agree that it's not much of I mean it's a it's it's basically a description of 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 uh, uh, of, uh, of the situation. And then there is the discussion on which are the sources of the difference. It's 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 a, it's a, it's much lighter than than what the than what, what the work has been done for for the numbers. So now I'm going to show you several. Okay, let me go back before I scare you with all these things. I'm going to go through a series of pictures which are 
built exactly, exactly the same way this has been built. Except that now, instead of showing you regions, I'm going to go to each region, and I'm going to give you all the countries of the region. Okay? And then the next two is going to be Latin America. But I'm going to go to a wider period. I'm going to start from 1930. And I'm going to break this in two, from 1930 to 1970-something, and then 1970-something to 2000. OK, so this is what I'm going to show you now. So it's going to look like a lot of, num a lot of uh, 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 lines, but, uh, but, I mean like, but the big picture is, will, come up, will come up clear. So this is Latin America. Relative, it's everything is relative to the US. That's why on this margin, you're always going to see either between 0% to 100% or between 0 and 1. This is going to be the axis always. So the solid black line is the average. OK, so this is giving us like pretty much the similar picture. The relative income has been basically uh, constant from 1935 to 1971. And then what you see here, uh, we have four countries below the average, which are Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, and three above the average, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. So, what you see is that, OK, these, these ones here, they kind of seem to go a little bit upwards. So like the poorest four, uh, not, not, not for Peru. Uh, but for the other three, they kind of go a little bit upwards. And they're up, there is like a coming down. So on average, you're basically constant. Now remember, this is a period in which many other countries in the world were growing at, 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 at rates much higher than the US. So basically, this, this black line here is constant is telling us that this, all these countries were growing on average at the same rate as the US. So they were not closing the gap at all. There was no convergence here. So this is 35 to 71. This is, this, does, this is not very good. The, the United States is a very rich country, so they, I mean, they can afford to grow at low rates. And that's, and that's what they can do. Uh, but we, I mean, we, we expect the poor countries, once they start growing, to get rates of growth which are higher than the, than the leading countries and, and then close the gap. Um, not because this, I mean, it's not like envy, like the comparison with the US being, well, if they can do it, then we should. It's a matter if you're closing the gap, you're growing faster. So it's going to be less decades until we see uh, a fraction of the of the of the child's uh, being all at least with shoes in the pictures when we take them. So this goes from 1935 to 1971, uh, and this is what happens from there on. Now I'm going to do a little bit of up and down. So just look at this axis. Don't 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 look at the numbers there. Okay. So I'm going to go up and down. So you're going to see that some stuff move. Moves, but you keep your eyes on this. I, I, I'm not cheating on the axis. Okay, so I go up. Whoops! No, I went down. I go there and there, there and there. See, this doesn't change. I'm not changing the scales. Okay, so whatever comes is exactly what comes right from here on. Whoops. Okay, so there we were until 1971. There we go after 1971. It's basically all going down. Okay, so this is much worse. This is not, we're not, we're, it's not that we're not closing the gap. We're actually growing at a lower rate. The gap is widening in this, in this period. And I'm going to give you a calculation of what uh, exactly means this widening of the gap. Okay, so here I was kind of getting picky. I wanted the black line to go up. But here it's going down. This is the average. Okay, the average is coming down all the way. And basically, all countries go down. When you look at the last 15 years, then you see a hero, right? The yellow. And I don't have to ask you which country that is. You cannot read because the letters there are very small. Which is the yellow country? Chile. Right? That's the one we we've been. We all stay there doing pretty bad. And then Chile has been growing like 8 7% for 15 years. Now, if, even if you look at the year 98, when they were in their best state, they were just at the same relative level as 1971. Okay? So they came down a lot. 
Now they're going up. Now why, what, what is it nice about Chile? There's nothing up here that they're going to stop. So what this thing seems to be pretty sustainable. So that's what's exciting about Chile. Not the state they have now is what it, they, they promised to have 20 years from now. And that's, and that's really exciting. Now, but even if you look farther back about the champion of Latin America, which is the yellow, remember this is a little bit above 35. That's Chile. So if we go back, oops, I went forward. Chile was 40% of the US until the 50s. OK, so this, this great thing that we know about Chile for the last 15 years has been basically catching up all the things that all, all the coming down they had for, for since, since I mean, the late, the, actually, the, the, yeah, that's the early 50s. So this is a pretty depressing picture. And uh, of course, the, the, the most depressing one is the blue. And you don't have to read the letters to know which one is the blue. But, but that's really depressing. It goes from 50% to 30%. And, geez, I keep on, and if you go back, I mean, this was between yeah, 50 and 55% since the Great Depression till, till the 50s. So from 50, we came down all the way to 30. Now we're, th this was the year 2000, then we went down a lot, and now we're up. We're probably a little bit above, on, on 35 by now. Uh, so in the, in the third day, I will concentrate on the, on the numbers for, for, for Argentina. OK, so this is. So let me set it in two ways. There are two ways in which we can think about this. That this is a bad picture, because we would like this to go up. But then once we saw what happened in the, in the following 30 years, uh, well, that, the one before wasn't that bad in the end. OK, so, but, but, but again, the, 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 the key thing is not to, to, to be able to go back to this, is to, to, to get the trend of Chile. I mean, that's like the challenge. That's what's going to make the Latin America a different region when I retire. Whether we can manage to have the black line, which is the average, to start behaving like the yellow line. Once it gets to 65%, uh, uh, we can discuss about the distribution. We can discuss all the things that we can do. For sure, we can do better than if we don't discuss those things. But the orders of magnitude are totally different. So I'll come back with a computation in the in the end. This is Europe, okay? So even if you compare this, that's a little bit of cheating because I'm the, 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 this is not I'm not keeping the vertical axis constant. Uh, but I mean, this goes from 0.2 to 0.8. It's not such a big difference than going from 20% to 50%. Okay? So this is the the the. the this is a comparison that is dramatic. And if you look to these Asian countries, it's even more dramatic. But this is a little bit of cheating. They're picking the Asian countries that grew. So you have other countries in Asia that didn't grow. So uh, why they pick those countries, they actually don't, I, I, I didn't find any reasonable explanation. They have a definition of which of the countries they pick. But they're basically the ones that at least catched up, catched up 10 percentage points of the of the gap, so that means they had to be going up. Now, what is still interesting at this picture is that when you look at this 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 five here, well, these are the the, the, the usual ones: Japan, who started this thing very early on, and then Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, the four tigers. We know we, we know that they have been doing very well. But even if you look at other countries like uh, Malaysia and Thailand, well, it has been a very interesting catch up at least in those countries. But again, there are other Asian countries which are not doing a catch up. So, so, so this is not a, like the whole region uh, being represented here. Uh, yeah. Although if you want to cheat doing this in Latin America, you can't. No, that's definitely true. No, that, I mean, that's a great point, actually. I had not uh, thought about it. But there's no way. Yeah, you can take Chile after after 1985. 
then you'll get one that will go up. Now, that, that's true. The, 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 that's, that's definitely true. If you compare, like, the winners with winners, there's no doubt that actually we don't have any winner. Uh, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, but it is still the case that we have many losers here, and they might have some. Uh, but I, when I actually plotted this data a couple of months ago for something else that I had to do, and the, I mean, the, this is the, the case of Peru. It's um, uh, it's really amazing. I mean, this, I mean, Peru went from 25 percent of the U.S. to less than 15 percent, and I mean, probably you can associate it to a particular period in terms of politics. But I mean, the trend is pretty much there. We've seen 30 years of of, of of going down the sink. I mean, Argentina is worst, of course, but that we knew. I mean, maybe you didn't, I knew. Uh, and that's why I didn't get surprised. But uh, uh, this is, I, I'll get to some numbers afterwards. Just, OK, maybe what I would like to emphasize is that just uh, switching from this to this has a huge impact. So if we could have repeated this misery for the following 30 years, the reality today would be totally different. And I want to get to some numbers that would reflect that at, at, uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes in the last, in the sal in the last slide. Oops, I, I, I keep on pushing the wrong button. So again, this is us, this is Europe, this is Asia. There's an interesting thing here, too, that I didn't know until I saw this data. If you start from here to there, then you see like somebody here that goes totally nuts. That's Ireland, right? Maybe you heard about the Irish miracle. Well, <laughs> when you look from a longer perspective, they were already in the winning team. And then they went to, the, to play in the minor leagues for a couple of decades, and now, now they're back. Uh, that's OK. The year I came to stay to Chicago, the Bears were the champions. Now they're going back. Uh, but there's still one thing more to do. But, uh, but basically, all these guys are going up. And even if you look like uh, uh, the, 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 the minor leagues, here you have uh, Portugal, you have Spain, and you have Greece. And yeah, you see that the European community made an impact, but the trend has been there since 1950. So it's definitely more, much more than, than, just, than just that. Um, so this is, I mean, going back, I, I, don't, I, don't know, I, I don't know really the numbers of aid for different countries after the war, but when you look at all this bunch of countries, they, I mean, the story seems to be like, except for, except for Ireland, because these were poorer than this, and they're still poorer than them. What I'm here, what I want to focus is on the trend, not much on which is the starting level. I'm not saying that Latin America is poor, that we knew. What I'm saying is that we haven't been doing much about it for the last 60 years. And actually, if you look at the last 30, we even went down relatively. So let me now. This is the obvious question, right? Why this happens? And I don't know. I told you. I wanted to talk about things I don't know the answer of. Now, this is an interesting thing the paper does, which is, uh, can we use data to narrow down the set of answers? So there are many possible answers. And what I want to do is at least to say, we don't have to look in here. This doesn't seem to be the road to know what goes on. Now, if you expect me at the end of these three meetings to tell you, so this is what we have to do, well, maybe this is time to leave, because I'm not going to tell you. I'm not because I'm a bad guy. It's just because I'm ignorant. Uh, now, if we knew what to do, we would be doing it. That's, that, that's probably the best way to look at it. Now, 
what I want to do is to use data that uh, I'm going to be taking tables from this paper to try to narrow down the set of possible answers. So basically, we have many suspects. I'm going to write all the possible suspects, and then we're going to freeze some of those. So they, these, these are not the ones to blame. And that's very important uh, because uh, that, that, that helps us focus on which, wh where the nature of the problem is. Because actually what I will do at the end, when I go to the case of Argentina, I will give you one way to go. Now I'm not fully convinced of it, and what I definitely cannot do is to have a decent theory with testable implications that I can uh, test and then tell you this is a solid theory, this is the answer. I will give you one answer, and I will give you one suspect, and I'll tell you what should we do in Argentina if we want to have no kids without uh, walking barefoot in the mud in, by the time I retire. Okay? Uh, but, I'm, but I won't try to do this for, for the general case, and on the other hand, I'm not even sure that will work, what I'll tell you. So we can start thinking about like s typical suspects. Like, well, maybe we don't work too much. And we don't like to work, and we like to work uh, less every time. And maybe that's why we're poor. Well, that's not the case. Uh, maybe we don't save enough. Now, when we were kids, we were told that if you save, then you become rich. So we didn't become rich. Well, maybe we didn't save. And that's not going to be the answer either. Maybe we're just not smart enough. We don't invest in human capital. We don't go to school, and then we don't know how to do things, and then we're, we're behind. And then that's why we don't grow. And I want to just put some numbers and argue that's not the case. In order to do that, let us write, I, I will write down a, a couple of equations just as, as a conceptual framework. This is not going to be very, very complicated. And this is, this, is, this is already in the paper. So, what is, I need to have a way to talk about aggregate numbers. Uh, and if you think in terms of what are all the assumptions that I'm making in order to talk about these aggregate numbers, the list is very, very long. And I'm not going to go through it. What I want to pursue you is that uh, thinking in these aggregate numbers will help me in, in, in trying to identify the, which are the potential suspects, and then eventually will help me to try to see which data I have to look at in order to identify which are the potential ones that, that to, be, to be blamed. So uh, this GDP per capita measure that, I've been, that we have been seeing is basically an accounting device, and you take the market value of all final products, goods and services, uh, produced in a country in a given year, you take the market value of that and you divide by the number of people. Okay? Uh, now, I want to think that each good is produced using, I mean, people have to work in order to produce goods and you have to buy machines and equipment in order to produce goods. So I'm going to be calling this labor on the one hand and this capital on the other hand. And of course, there are many different types of labor, many different types of capital. If I start dealing into those issues, We'll be at the third lecture, and we wouldn't have advanced anything. So I will just go to aggregates. And then what, basically what I'm going to think is not that there are different goods, that this total GDP is like something that we produce. This is like the number of pizzas that we produce. And then we produce these using uh, people that work and ovens in which you put the pizza. And the number of pizzas you produce depends on how much people you have working and how many ovens you have. And you can think that the flour and all the tomatoes and all that, you can think that it's capital. So going a little bit uh, into, I had to put equations. I mean, I'm an economist. I can't avoid that. So I want to think of this as a, as a production function that we call. So this YTJ is going to be the GDP in country J time T. That's the things we've been looking, right? We've been looking at different countries and different periods. So. This is just telling how much you produce in, in one country at a given period. And I want to concentrate on the two terms on the right. Then I'll talk a little bit about the first one on the, on the right-hand side. So L is labor, as you could imagine, and K is capital, as you, can, as you could also imagine, given that I told you there's going to be capital and labor. So you may wonder what's A, and I'll get to that. So, this is just a particular functional form. These O4 and O6 are exponents, so this is going to be an exponential function. It uh, has the attractive feature that 0.4 plus 0.6 is 1. 
Uh, this has very nice properties. This is like a decent description of what GDP is in, in an economy uh, from the empirical point of view. Why 0.4 or why 0.8? Because we know. Actually, it's not, and it varies across countries, but 0.4 and 0.6 are gonna, are gonna do it for me today. Uh, you can estimate those things. But uh, just, just take them as, a, as, an, as an approximation. Now, what's the key thing? Labor, you have to wake up every day and go to work, okay, these many hours. Now, how many ovens do you have? Well, that's the stock of capital, okay? So in order to get more capital at period t plus one, you get what you had at time t, uh, and then you add what we call investment, okay? So this is gonna help me in terms of which are the kind of numbers that I want to look at. This delta is supposed to be like a positive number, we call it depreciation rate, so one minus delta is like something like 0.9. That means that 10% of your ovens break when you produce pizza. So if you start with 100 ovens, then next year you only had 90, if you don't invest in more. Okay, so you have, if you want to increase capital, which is good because then you have more production, then you have to invest every year. So what I was telling you, we are poor because we don't have capital, it's because we don't save, because as we don't save, then we cannot invest, we don't accumulate machines, and then we're poor. So those are the things that I will be able to measure, and that's the, right, the, the nice thing, because we, either we have uh, a censuses and we have uh, um, uh, surveys in which we ask people whether they work or not and how many hours they work. So I can measure that, the, that L there, and by, and we measure investment in the national account, so using that I can measure capital over time. So what is this? Well, this is gonna be what, what we call total factor productivity, which basically means how efficient are you at combining the machines and the, and the labor. Of course, when you think in terms of a single good, then it's, I mean, you know how to make a pizza. Uh, now, when you think in terms of the whole economy, this basically, this A is telling you how efficient is the economy to allocate resources in order to produce output. So what is it gonna depend on? I'm gonna assume that for every country J, the number is a number which is equivalent to the number of the US multiplied, this is like a grid letter called eta, which is gonna be specific to a period and to a country. Okay, so basically, what the, you know, the way in which we want to think about it is that you have the, the, the DAF, and then you have the, the labor, and you have the ovens, and then you combine the workers with the ovens to make pizzas. And then, uh, if you're very efficient with the same amount of ovens and people that other pizza places, you produce more pizzas than this other pizza place. So this is what this A is gonna measure. This, this number is gonna be between zero and one most of the times. Even though it, it doesn't need to be, uh, but most of the times in the computations it will come out like that, which basically means that it is possible that even if you have the same amount of people working and the same amount of machines, you don't produce as much as any as, as other country. Why? Well, that's a mystery. That's exactly what we cannot really explain very well. So, in a sense, this is going to be like a residual of the of the of the equation. It somehow measures why some countries without working much more and without having many more machines, they end up producing more than other countries. Um, it happens to me we don't have great theories of this in economics, we have some. By great theory I mean a reasonable model that then you check, you take the model to the data and you do very well many times, right? Like, you have, like when doctors, they have to approve a medicine, well, that's what you have to do. Uh, that we don't have, what we can do is to measure this number. So, once we have this conceptual framework, then we can start thinking of first making it in terms, in per capita terms, right? Because that was total GDP. Now I have to divide it by the number of people in the country. So the nice thing is that, I, if of course, if I divide on one side and I have to divide on the other, so the fact that 0 0.6 and 0 0.4 add up to one means that then I can put this N divided on L and the N divided on K. So basically what this is telling us is that the evolution of the GDP per capita, which is what I have on the left, depends on these three things. 
the evolution of total factor product productivity, which is ATJ, 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 the accumulation of capital, which is the term on the on the right, and the evolution of labor to the population ratio, right? So maybe we just lost relative to the U.S. because that number L divided by N went down over time relative to the U.S., which means we don't like to work. Well, the, the interesting thing is that we can measure these two things. And in the end, I'll tell you, it's none of the two in the right. So let me take one at a time. Uh, well, actually, before taking one at a time, this is not the number I've been giving you. That's total per capita GDP. Uh, but I've been showing you per capita GDP relative to the one in the US. So now let me, if this is like for country J, this is like for Argentina, then the numbers I show you is this one divided by the number in the US. So let me do that in order to get it in a much clearer way. So this is GDP, uh, now this is uh, per capita uh, of the Argentina divided by the US. So the evolution over time is going to depend on one of the three things in this parenthesis. So how much capital you accumulate per capita relative to the US, how much you work per capita relative to the US, and what's your total factor producti productivity relative to the US. This is accounting, OK? This is an equality, so it has to be one of these three things. So when I told you in the beginning, the data will help us to eliminate some suspects. This is exactly what I was talking about. We have a problem with the number on the left. Then we want to understand which one of the, which one of the numbers in the right is responsible for it. Now, this is exactly the same thing, except that I express this using this eta tj. Let me remind you what that eta tj was. It's exactly this number here. So if I divide this by the productivity of the US, eta is telling us what's happening with the total efficiency of the economy over time. So we have three different suspects. The evolution of total factor productivity, the efficiency of the economy, the accumulation of capital, or the evolution of the labor to the population ratio. So whether we became more lazy or not. So these are the numbers. Let's start with the ratio of labor to the population. So these are the numbers. This is table four from the paper. These are employment rates by region. So what is it that you see here? Well, I'm using this fact of being lazy as a, as a as a Mickey Mouse description, right? If you have a lot of people that work at their house, uh, like people who grow cows and not I mean, the, the guys that grow cows, they sell them. But if you have like people in the countryside, like that they grow goats and they basically feed their family with those goats, they're not going to show up in the numbers like working. Okay, so you have this, of course, these these trends. So if you look at 1950, well, indeed, you see that Latin America was the the, the region in which the fraction of I mean, the employment divided by, by the population was, was rather low. But what matters here, this might explain why we were poorer than the US in 1950. Now, for this to be the, expl the explanation, what we should observe is that while in the US it went up, like in Latin America it went down a lot. Right? But this is not about being poorer than the US. This is about becoming even more poorer over this time period. And what you actually see is that it, between 1973 and almost the end of the, of the, of the century, uh, actually there, not, there was not much change. Actually, Europe went down, and we went up. So we are actually working more as a fraction of the population than what we did in 1973. The Europeans are working less, and they became much richer than us during the same time period. So that much for the laziness hypothesis. Isn't here. Now, of course, you can say, well, you have more people working, but you know, nobody goes to school anymore, and that, that's not true either. This is a measure, this is an index. This is all relative to the US. But this basically measures how many years of education on average the population of the of the region has. So if you look between this is not easy to to to, to compute, right? You need 
uh, census data and then aggregate, so you don't have for every year. But if you compare 1960 to 1990, actually, this is relative to the U.S., so the one that closest, that, that closed the gap fastest was Latin America. We went up nine points relative to the U.S., while Europe went only eight and Asia went only seven. So actually, the gap, the educational gap that exists, uh, we closed it faster than these other regions. So it's not that we don't work, it's not that we don't study. So if I go back to the suspect, uh, it isn't here. So it is, there are only these two left. Now, what happens with, the, with capital? Well, I'm going to measure it two different ways, which is the way they measure it. Um, and, and, and that's why I gave you the equation with the accumulation of capital. So the first thing I'm going to look is capital to output ratios. That's the total amount of machines, and then you divide by, by output, because that gives you a measure of how much capital you have per unit of output. Okay, because one of the theories was that we didn't accumulate much capital, so then this ratio would have, should have been going down in, in Latin America relative to the U.S. Well, when you look at it, it, it it's not there either. It was 0.83, went up to 0.88, to 0.89, and actually by the 80s, the caput, capital out, output ratio of Latin America was the same than the U.S. So we actually, in terms of capital to output ratios, we closed the gap again here. Now, of course, Asia closed it much faster than us because they started at a lower level, uh, and also Europe closed the gap. So when you look actually at the 80s, you're not going to see much difference in terms of how many machines you have per unit of output. So it's not that we just didn't accumulate capital during all these decades at a, at the at a, at a, at a slower rate. What happens if instead of looking at the total number of ovens to make pizza that you have in a given time, you look at how many new ovens you put into the, into the capital stock, which is the investment rate? Of course, the two things are related, right? The way in which you keep your capital to output ratio is by investing more ovens. But even if you look at the investment rates, you, you see some things. Like, we have a lower investment rate than Asia. That's why we might be poorer. But when you compare this to the U.S., basically, I mean, this is up to measurement error, the same numbers. So it's not the accumulation of capital. Uh, so this is our suspect that is left. It's total factor productivity, which is even sad, right? Because if you're poor, but because you don't work, or at least you're enjoying life. But it isn't like that. We are working, we're going to school, we're accumulating machines, and yeah, you can say that we're not doing like Asia is doing, but I mean, we're, I'm talking about the gap with the US. I was not showing you the gap between Latin America and Asia. That would have been totally dramatic. I'm talking about the gap with the US, so. Now, this is depressing from the point of view of being an economist, because I told you, we don't have a great theory about total factor productivity. And, and I, I'll go a little bit more into this next, next time. But basically, <clears throat> the way in which we found out this was going on was because the first time that somebody wrote this equation, they didn't write the A. What is this A? I mean, it's the efficiency. It's just, well, we're supposed to be reasonable people, so when we, we get the, the, the tomatoes in the right place and the cheese in the right place, and we leave the pizza in the oven the right amount of time. What do you mean? And then there might be something that, has been, that went wrong in a particular production process for a particular country, but this is about an aggregate. How can you screw up big time all across the border? So nobody thought about this either. So the guy who wrote this for the first time and then won the Nobel Prize afterwards, he started measuring things and he systematically found that countries that grew had a term there that would go up over time. The reason why economies become rich is because they become more efficient, not because they work more or because they accumulate more machines, even though accumulating machine helps. But that's not the, what's driving the, the, the growth experiences. So if you go back to this 
numbers. What's behind here is that that eta for Latin American has been going down relative to the US. The total factor productivity, that total efficiency with which you measure the, the, the with, with which you with which you allocate resources has been going down relative to the US. And on the other hand, in these two regions has been dramatically going up. So these regions became way more efficient relative to the US, even though they didn't get there yet. It is still true that the most efficient among one of the most efficient economies is the US, if you measure it with in terms of these of these etas. But uh, but the difference between these pictures is basically this. So this is like when you that when you come back home after you've been traveling to a country which is fifteen thousand miles away, and then you do like this and say, "Oh, I don't have the keys." So either I left it in the bag on my left or I left it in the bag on my right, or in the hotel room in the other continent. You have three suspects, and you end up with the one that was the wrong one. I told you, we don't have a great theory for this. It's not that we, we know which are the policies that make people study more. So if that were the problem, we knew the answer. We know which are the policies that make you save more, that will make you invest more. So we kind of knew the answers. Um, can I ask a question about this? Uh, sure. Um, Confused about this actually. Can you go back to the, the, the first formulas, the A? Yeah. Uh, what, um, Here? Right there. Yeah. Right there. So, but I thought, I mean, if you're talking about productivity. Yes. And I thought you had eliminated productivity as a suspect. No, I think that is the only suspect left. Um. What I'm saying is not the accumulation of resources. Here is Okay. What this is telling you is that if you have much, many more machines than the other country, all well, you're going to be richer. You will produce more. If you work more, you're going to be... What I'm saying is that if you get the total labor of Argentina and the total capital of Argentina, and you put it together with the A of the U.S., production would be three times as large as what it is in Argentina today. Mm -hmm. And... Um, by the I stands for oh no this the, this is in, for capital. this is this is capital which is the stock of machines that you have this is the number of machines that you add up to the production process every period which is investment investment and you're counting all any kind of investment including foreign directives absolutely yeah. Yeah, that is this, the, that actually would be the difference between domestic savings and investment. The fact that you might have foreign investment, and if you see like the numbers for Asia, the, one of the big differences is that in, in some of these countries have been foreign direct investment, precisely. But I'm count, we're counting it. Well, I don't know. I, uh, the paper, if you're still talking about the paper, um, the the how they break up. Uh, into periods, I found it confusing and kind of obscuring data. Um, so, because my, actually also how they uh, um, lump Latin American countries together, very different countries like Brazil, which has had a lot of foreign uh, direct investment. Where more than others, More yeah. More than others. Mexico, whereas Bolivia, I think that they're, they're including Bolivia in their sense. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. They, they're here. And, and which had much less investment. Um, and much less education. Um, okay, there's, 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 there's an important point you're making, which is that when, I, when I'm going through the list of suspects, I'm only looking at the regional aggregates. What I've been showing you is the employment to population rates, ratios for all Latin America. I didn't go eliminating suspects country by country. And, you're, and I agree with you that that's what they do. You, 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 in your numbers, you include all Latin American countries. 
D depending which numbers, not in these ones. This each country is, is one figure. Oh, and okay, okay. So here is one country, is, is a, it's a line. So when I don't feel that uncomfortable with the aggregation because of the following. This is what I have done before. This is, from, this is, uh, this is Latin America from 71 to 2001. And this is Latin America from 35 to 1971. So like, you see like two different groups of countries, these ones that are there and these ones that are here. But these ones be, don't behave like much differently from each other in terms of the long run trend. I'm not talking about the movements in there. right? But and then if you go like this, something happened to all these countries. And then something happened to Chile here. Right? Chile was like coming down in the boat with everybody and then jumped out. Now, it's still if you make these exercises country by country, you're going to get that the, 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 the one that explains the majority of the, of the differences is the productivity. But my, no, I'm sorry. My question is how, where you're getting that productivity for the U.S. to measure the others against. I'm, I'm yeah. going to figure out what the five to five that means. The, by differencing. Basically, this is the way in which I do it. If I look at the equation in which I measure GDP per capita in relative terms, I can measure from indep independently from the data. I can measure this ratio from national accounts. I can measure this ratio because I have population data and employment data. I can measure this ratio because I have investment and capital and population. So the difference is going to be this. So I plug in. I have. I have for. I have this number, this number, and this number. So then I use this equation to estimate the, pro the, the, the productivity differential. So that's why I said it's, it, you, you measure it like as a residual. And, and, and going back to the point, I agree with you there are going to be differences country by country. And then I will concentrate in the end in a particular country. And this picture that I'm telling you, this is the suspect. I'm not, I, I'm not aiming it as this one is what explains 100% of the differences. It will vary from country to country. But, uh, and there, of course, there have been countries in which investment has been larger than others. But in those countries, this is going to be even more the suspect. Because it's even more puzzling that it is true that compared to some of the South American countries, and in some periods, Brazil got more foreign direct investment, for instance, than Argentina. Not obviously than to Chile in the last decade, but definitely more than Argentina. But, uh, or, or than Uruguay, but when you look at the performance of Brazil, it was as poor as the, as, as the performance of the other countries. So given that even in Brazil they had more investment, it's even more puzzling that Brazil didn't close the gap, well, which means that in Brazil this will have to explain even a larger fraction of the difference. I'm not, I'm not saying that international aid helps. I mean, the Marshall Plan worked, but um, I'm actually very critical of international mm. aid and and certainly of foreign direct investment I mean that's why you see Ireland Ireland's GDP going up so much because they had a lot of foreign direct investment in the past uh, yeah you know, 15 years years but what does that really mean in the long term is this a, a, a sustainable development that's what I'm wondering about um. and and um, so that's I'm, I'm not saying uh, Anyway, I mean, I'm, no, I was just wondering about how yeah. the coal paper just lumps everything together in a, in a, oh, a, a historical way. And so, and when you present your uh, uh, data, and so, I mean, you you do, um, uh, I mean, you you do a better job at, at um, you know separating uh, very different countries from, from one another. So, I mean, your your slides are are more clear in that respect. So you're, you know, you 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 pick individual countries and you show for in for these individual countries how their how how their GDP is going up or going down. So. Yeah, I did that to, to some extent by looking at these numbers. It is still true that I'm showing you only averages when I when I tell this is not a suspect we should retain in jail. Let's just free this suspect. And. Um, but, and, and, and there are going to be some, some, some differences across countries. I was just trying to deliver like the, the, the big picture of here. So let me just go to this last computation. This is the last, the last slide. So uh, 
and then we may eventually go back to, to the point because this this is this is my number here. So what's the implication then of all this? Like in 1980, now I'm not going back to let like, 35. I'm just looking at the last Latin American picture when I started in 70 something, and then it went up until the 80, and then it started coming down. So if you look at the number of that graph, the average for GDP was 33% of the US level in 1980. Okay? Now in 2001, right before the crisis, the Argentina and Uruguay, the crisis was huge, but all the Latin American countries went through a crisis in 2001. It was 23%. This is before the crisis. It's not the crisis explained in the 23. It's the period from 1980 to uh, basically 2000. These were 20 years in which we went from 33% of the U.S. level to 23% of the U.S. level. Now, what this is this graph. Let me go quickly back. This is this is this graph. Okay, this is 1980. So you see, this where the this was been going up until 1980. The black line, remember, is the Latin American average. So if you put the cursor here, it will tell you it's 33%. Now when you go back here, it's 23%. Okay, I'm talking about these two decades, and I'm talking about the Latin American average, right? So this is the the period in which. Uh, well, actually, uh, Chile did a little bit better than the, than the rest. All of the other countries went down. So uh, this is the exercise that I want, to I want to make. I want to get here with the black line, and then I want to keep it constant to here. OK? So I'm not asking too much. I'm not trying to get Latin America to do like this or this. I'm just trying to get that from 1980 on, we did, well, as we had done before. Not even. This is going a little bit up. I'm just imagining that we would be saying here, look, another 30 years in which this was constant. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it went down 10 percentage points. OK, so this is the, the, the number I want, to, I want you to think. Not Hong Kong, not uh, Spain, just maintaining our 33%. So what the numbers would be today? Because I said, it looks like hey, 35, 25%. These are, what's 5%? Well, I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you in numbers what is that 10%. OK? So if we had kept the US pace, OK, if we keep our average constant, it's because we grow at the same rate than the US. So if we had done like the US, which by far is not the best grower, when you think in the last couple of decades, then the GDP per capita today it would be 45% more. That's a huge number. So what I want you now is to run the picture of the, well, we had these five kids, four of them were naked and barefoot in the mud. Well, maybe with 45% more GDP per capita, we only had, I, I wasn't going to say two barefoot, but let's say only three. Well, that's doubling the number of kids that can get shoes. And I'm not talking about like a great century. I'm not talking like being in the New York Times, Latin America is being the growest, you know, saying only 2%. Now, if you, Start making computations like, what if we would have done like, then your brain goes just below totally. Because these numbers can easily be like 200%. So that's basically what I wanted to focus on. Once you start thinking about this, now if the, if the region is 45% richer, well, in all discussions we can have about better health care for the poor, better education for the poor, they're going to be done in a totally different environment. So, so this is talking about what the last two decades were. Now the question is what the next two are going to be. And here is the, our friend. 
how do we get our economies to be more efficient? The solution is not that we have to accumulate much more capital, all that will help. I mean, uh, but accumulating capital means investing a lot, and investing a lot means you consume less. Okay, so if you're investing a lot for 10 years, well, you cannot think too much about having a, more schools and, and, and more hospitals or if you're just accumulating machines. So this is basically the, 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 the suspect. And then the question in the end is going to be uh, what the next decades are going to look when we plot the, this graph from 2001 to 2020. Uh, because this is like the big question. I have my own and very strong opinions on how much redistribution there should be in an economy. And I can tell you about them. But I don't want to talk about it now. Honestly, if, if the region does totally different policies than what I would like, but grows at the rate of Chile for 15 years, I don't care. I think it's, it's much more important to get the region going. I'm not going to get ambitious to the yellow thing. I'm just trying to close the gap at a decent pace. Uh, I mean, that's 99% of the discussion, if we get that. And then there's a 1% left in terms of whether we go for public schools, which are free, or whether we have to have free universities, whether we have to have a public health system for everybody, we, we, go, we go to that discussion. But, okay, let me reduce my number from 99% to 90%. But 90% of the discussion should be, how do we get this picture turned upside down? Once we're in the process, then we can talk about these other things. Is this real GDP or only nominal GDP? No, real, real. Oh. No, no, this, this is real. This is like total number of pizzas you make a year. Okay, if it was nominal, the story would be even worse. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, that would, be, that would be totally dramatic. No, this is real GDP. This is, we're, this is taking away the effect of price increases, and then we're really measuring here how many pizzas per, 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 per capita you produce. In the, in the economy. Uh, another comment. Um, when you do the evolution of capital accumulation in Latin America from the 70s and on, um, an important factor there is, there is investment, right? And you're getting these numbers from the, from the national accounts. Yeah. Now, so you will be taking investment from um, the government side of the equation and from the private side of the equation, right? Yep. Um, an interesting thing is that. Uh, during the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of government expenditure going into investment, basically through the capital expenditure account, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it supports your theory in the sense that even though there was so much money being invested, yeah. a lot of it was just going down the drain. It was waste because a lot of it went to hospitals without doctors or to huge plants that were never used for production. And it was a lot of waste. So at the end of the day, yes, it doesn't matter how much to invest. But how much you also get out of that investment, the return that you get, and that's something where Latin America failed miserably since from the 70s, 80s, and maybe until now. Well, um, definitely that's a possibility. And it, it look, if you look at the accounting that I'm making in terms of my, of my equation, where will that show up? Uh, remember, this is just an accounting identity, this one I have here, which is the one we, we talked about. Okay, so what, what am I putting in? So your point is, when you put the K for Argentina, then you put the number you get from the, from the, uh, from the balances. But it happens to be that the Argentinian government had been spending a huge amount of money in a dam in a river with the frontier with Paraguay for 15 years. And I've never seen the, the detailed study, but numbers say that if you compare with the, the cost of that dam with the most expensive dam in the world is going to be like four times. I mean, th this is the order of magnitude. So what you're saying, what well, you're putting here a lot of stuff which is not going to increase the GDP of Argentina. So think in terms of the equation and the accounting. 
assume we're measuring this properly, okay? Now, we're measuring these things well, but we're not measuring well the capital for Argentina because we're having, we're putting there a larger number. You see that the dummy is there, right? But it's actually a third of the size or of the, uh, or as efficient as it should be with that money, if, we, if I take that example. Where will the number show up? Well, this is the, I mean, this is the number you got. Uh, this is, it'll, the, the, you, this you didn't measure well. This is higher. Means that this is that the residual is gonna give you like a lower efficiency. So what you're saying is it's going to fit into my measure of efficiency. But uh, look at, uh, this is what has to be true. What has to be the case is that if this was very inefficient in the 70s, it got much worse for the following 20 years. Because relative, is, what, you can argue that this is, that ours, that the one in Argentina is lower than for the U.S. But what is happening is that not only is lower, it's also been going down. So if there was an inefficiency in the way in which capital was allocated, it got worse in the following decades. Okay, so, and, but, but I agree with you. This is gonna show up exactly in my measure of efficiency. And, 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 that's, and there is like a clear example. That's the notion, right? You, are, you have a lot of capital, but you have it like in the wrong place. You have it in a river that doesn't have water. Well, that's not a very useful dam. Maybe the accounting for the unofficial economy may mitigate the dollar for the growth rate. But that could be the case. But again, what you need is that because, like, if you don't measure 20 percent of your pro of the GDP because uh, you know people don't want to pay taxes and then they go underground and then you don't get in the statistics, what you need is that this got this got much worse also during the the, the so you don't need that there's a Okay, the, the theory should be not only that it's a larger underground market, but also that it got much worse during the following couple of decades. That, that's hard to justify, at least for, for the countries that I know a little bit. I mean, not that there is uh, an underground sector, the fact that it grew a lot uh, relative to, to, uh, to what GDP is. And, and the other way in which you can go and measure that is in terms of real wages. Because if this, if this were the case, when you look at the wage, then you shouldn't see like a great, a, a, a big difference with the wage in the U.S. Because you're just measuring, the, the, you're just have a problem of measurement of total GDP. But the real wage, you have to pay competitive wages. In, in, in of course, they're different for underground economy than for the for the regulated labor market. But they move together very similarly. So. Uh, you, you, it is also the case that wages have been going down, which is consistent with the fact that productivity. And I'm, of course, I'm talking relative to the U.S. Oh. Yes. I agree that uh, it doesn't make much sense to redistribute cents. You want to have dollars, but a yeah. big bag in order to redistribute. But I don't know. It's just like more tricky when you pass the threshold of for saying, now it's okay to redistribute. Mm. Like fussy, and, and I don't know if there's really a separation between redistribution and growth. No, it's not. I don't, okay, there might be. There is a discussion about it, whether if you have very redistributive policies, you affect, you affect growth. Uh, I don't think it's a settled issue, but, uh, but I, I, th I think I didn't, exp I, I, I didn't say it properly. I'm not saying let's not do it now. I mean, we can open the discussion, let's, let's do it now. What I'm saying, doing this is not going to change dramatically the lives of 60% uh, of the poor people uh, in, a, in, a, in a deep sense. Uh, now, um, particularly if you think in terms of the experiences. I mean, we had this kind of policies in Latin America for, for years. So if you think in terms of which, and there have been ones that were being very effective, uh, I'm particularly the one that I, I, I haven't worked on it myself, but they, you know, people who had been doing it, there, there was a, a special program that was launched in Argentina in 2002, well, with many problems. I mean, you can criticize the program in many dimensions, but when you look at the impact it had on, the, on poverty rates, it was very important. And I think it was key for having a decent recovery after the, after the crisis. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. What I'm saying is that if we want to think, I want to think in that picture. So I have these four kids, 
these five kids and there have these four that I described you before, I think that with these policies, maybe we can have another one. Uh, but if you want to wipe out those four, I mean, not wipe out the kids, you want to put the shoes on those four kids. We want to end up by going to the places, taking pictures and not seeing these naked, barefoot kids. It requires to, have to, 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 to grow a lot. That, so, so I'm not saying let's wait 20 years and then let's start doing the redistributive policies. And, and, and again, and, and I think that this particular policy, which now has been criticized uh, more and more, and probably they're going to take it out, these uh, jefes y jefas. It was basically a program to just deliver money directly to the head of the household of very poor people. There's been some corruption, but, but, but they really targeted a group of people and they really got a, a big effect. But I mean, this, now they're saying, okay, this was just for the crisis when unemployment rate was 26% and the poverty rate went to 50%. So the, I'm, I'm, let's go for that. What I'm saying is that this is not what's going to change that picture in a dramatic way. Having a GDP per capita, which is instead of 23, 40% of GDP, I think it's going to change that picture dramatically. If we, we also make good policies, it's going to change it even more. So I don't think there is any inconsistency, even though I mean, there, there is a debate about whether if you do too much redistribution, you affect growth. Uh, but no, I, I don't think they're inconsistent. I think they're for different things. One is, ones are going to be very important for dealing with, like, uh, like particularly these huge shocks that you have for in some of these crises. And they had one in Chile, too, in 82, 83, which was very similar to the one in Argentina. Uh, and, 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 and that also had a, sim a similar, similar impact. Uh, but, uh, but if you want to get from one four to four one, I, I don't think those policies are going to be enough. I haven't seen any country who could do it without a substantial increase in GDP per capita. That, that, that's what I, what I thought. Okay, so uh, I guess that's it.